Uh, was there another announcement? I don't think so. No, I think. Yeah, and so we're going to have uh, Shireen's coming. So one of the launches that we're going to do with our uh, wonderful life is to launch our children's ministry. And Shireen and, and Alicia and Wendy are kind of doing that. So come on. Jesus wants me for a sun beam to shine for him each day. In every way, try to please him at home, at school, at play. A sun beam, a sun beam. Jesus wants me for a sun beam, a sun beam, a sun beam. I'll be a sunbeam for him. What this sounds like. Right. I know as children, you usually enjoy yourself in Sunday school and children's church or Sabbath school and so forth. So now we want our children out. And so we are launching our children's ministry, which will be on January 8th. So we are inviting you to invite persons. It could be your daughter, it could be your grandchildren, it could be your niece, it could be your nephew, right? And I know pastor of grandchildren will come. Therefore, we are asking you to invite them out. Just tell them what we're about, because what? What we plant in them at a young age, it would stay in them. Because guess what? The seeds were planted in me. That's why I'm here now. So we are imploring you to get the children out. Let them know that we want them. We need them. They are our future. So when they come out, we will have our lovely day. So it will be on January 8th, 2023. So we are ringing in the new year with our children's ministry. Put your hands together for our children when they come. Thank you. Psalm 25, verses 1 to 11. O Lord, I give my life to you. I trust in you, my God. Do not let me be disgraced or let my enemies rejoice over me. In my defeat, there we go. No one who trusts in you will ever be disgraced, but disgrace comes to those who try to deceive you, others. Show me the right path, O Lord. Point out the road for me to follow. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God who saves me. All day long I put my hope in you. Remember, O oh Lord, your compassion and unfailing love, which you have shown from long ages past. Do not remember the rebellious sins of my youth. Remember me in the light of your unfailing love, for you are merciful, O oh Lord. The Lord is good and does what is right. He shows the proper path to those who go astray. He leads the humble in doing right, teaching them his way. The Lord leads with unfailing love and faithfulness all who keep his covenant and obey his demands. For the honor of your name, O Lord, forgive my many, many sins. Amen. Allows me to, to be grateful for what I have. God wants you to declare Jesus as Lord of your lips. That he not only died to save your life, he died to control your mouth. And it is this lack of control that leads to explosive fires in families, in churches, in society. But it is this control that brings hope and help to those who desperately want it in a time of need. Let's find out what it means to watch your mouth as we understand the power of the tongue. Amen. How many of you have a powerful tongue in your lips? <laughs> and we're going to look at that. I just finished watching that series on right now. So if you haven't joined right now, I encourage you to join it and watch these high end teachers. Uh, you can watch uh, illustrations and media, Bible studies. 
studies of the book, like all the books of the Bible. You can watch like this one, Watch Your Mouth, is more, uh, um, what do you call that? Um, I can't even remember what it's called. But anyways, more uh, talking about, what is that? Topical, thank you, hallelujah. Watch my mouth, praise God. Anyways, you know, I thought it was powerful, uh, the testimony that Sharon gave on what a wonderful life is. You know, so much of the Western thought is a wonderful life is about, you know, comfort. It's about happiness. And yet, a wonderful life in God, if you study Scripture, doesn't show that. We see Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, coming down as we sang, Emmanuel, God with us, and offering his life, dying and being persecuted for proclaiming the good news and doing good, put on a cross for us. The early church, the apostles, all the, all the uh, people that followed the church and when it was born, they died, they were put in jail, they were persecuted, and yet their words of their mouth and the meditation of the heart wasn't in their suffering, it was in what God has done. And so this morning I'm going to carry on on It's a Wonderful Life by our words. You know, I hear so much as a pastor um, of people talking within the church walls. That one woman says, I realize, if you watch that mo the actual teaching, on, she realized her dad was a pastor and how the people attacked him and spoke against him when he did something they didn't want. And I thought, man, isn't that reflected in the church today? Is the words that we speak uh, will bring life and death, as we'll see in the Scripture here in a, in a little bit. And so if you haven't heard the testimony of what a wonderful life really looks at about Sharon, it's on YouTube. Just go to YouTube, vcop.ca, and you'll, you'll be able to watch the, the interview, or you can do it on Facebook right now. We're in the penalty on Facebook, but uh, you can through, see everything through uh, uh, YouTube. You know, Sharon, what she described is a very full life. How many of you live a full life? Whether it's busyness, whatever it is. She described this full life. But she also described a life after confessing Jesus of much heartache. And I know Sharon. I know what she's gone through. I know some of the things. And it's not Mike. <laughs> yeah, Mike is a blessing. But the, problem, the thing is, is even despite... Uh, Sharon confessing all these heartaches and these things she's, she's done or experienced, she would describe herself, I would say, as a wonderful and a full life. I mean, she, she did things that what I consider an old age uh, where I, don't, you know, I didn't want to do it at 30. She went over to Cambodia and worked as a, a house mom working with the children that were rescued in the sex trade. And I don't know, how old were you? 65, 60, 68 years old. And we say, oh, I don't have a purpose anymore, you know, when we get older. But the point is, is we do. And Sharon's a proof of that. Uh, but our words will affect us. See, understanding a wonderful life from a biblical perspective uh, enables us to weather storms, prevent faith being shipwrecked, and from our, we our faith being weaponized as individuals. You know, Job was a man recorded in the Old Testament and he held on to trusting God when tragedy hit his life, even though his wife said, curse God and die. And his friends came along in their great comfort and says, well, it's because of sin in your life, Job. You know, you just got sin. That's why God's judging you. Or, or you got to have more faith, Job. It's because you're not a faithful man. And they attacked him. And these are his friends. They had their opinions about God and his judgment Job's faith, and Job's sin. Now, haven't we heard this in our churches today, in our society? Eh? Uh, why people are, when people are suffering, or there's relational breakdown and faith, or crisis, faith crisis and material setbacks, only to be told to believe more, trust more, have more faith. You know, and I know, we can't, we can't increase our faith on our own. It takes Holy Spirit to do it, and it takes God's Word, and we're going to look at that. The wonderful life is not connected to your comfort, and it's not connected to your happiness, but it's actually about our attitude or our heart towards God and others. And it's always reflected, as we watch in that video, in how we speak, how we speak to ourselves, how we speak to church, how do we speak to society, and how we speak on social media and to our family. And so this morning, I want to touch on our words. It's a wonderful life 
our words. Have you ever used negative words? How many of you use negative words? <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm glad you're... Man, you guys are honest. Hallelujah. Yeah, we've all used uh, negative words. We've used words about ourselves, like, I'm so stupid. I'm a loser. I'm ugly. A waste of skin. Or even like George Bailey in the movie, I wish I was never born. Maybe there's some here today that, that think those. They look in the mirror and they go, gee, I... I'm, I'm not who I want to be, or I'm such a bad person, or I'm so, I've done this, or I've got to do more. I, you know, I don't even know why I'm here. Or maybe we speak those words uh, towards others. If they would only get their act together. We walk, drive down, looking at street. I mean, I'm guilty of this. You drive down, looking at street people, or think, people that are out of sorts in society, and we go, if they just get a job, if they just get their act together, you know? Just do this. Or I hope what they get is coming to them. Somebody that's been hurt, especially in the church. I hope they got church, or I hope that person gets what's coming from. I want my pound of flesh. I want my justice. Or they deserve what they got. Anybody have you ever used that one? Inside our heads or outwardly? Boy, I, they sure deserve that. Um, and that's... The problem with our words is because our words create a harvest. If we're all honest, negative words, uh, there's times when we could reverse. I'm a talker. I don't know if you've figured that out. I like to chat. I know. It's, it's, it's kind of a hidden trait of mine. But, you know, there's times when I speak and I go, gee, I wish I could reverse my lips. <laughs> you know, I, I wish I wouldn't have said that. And then when I do say then I, I'm sent on a, a re, uh, reclaiming condition of forgiveness and helping people understand what I really was trying to say. But I do these, and others do these with their spouses, their parents, their children, their neighbors, their coworkers, family, and especially today in social media and self. And it's not just the world. I expect that from the world. But what I don't expect is from God's people. And, of course, Proverbs declares this. It says, the tongue can bring death and life. Now, we like that little part. But look the next part. It says, those who love to talk will reap the consequences. So whether it's a good or a negative, you'll reap a harvest or a consequence. Because words are compared to seeds in the Bible. Uh, Jesus is the seed of God. He says, unless a, a grain or a wheat dies and, and goes to death, it can only be one seed. But once it produces, it produces many more seeds. And Jesus was our seed that died. He's the seed of faith. When we ask him in, he begins to grow within our lives if we allow it. And so we need to understand that our words produce a harvest, good or bad, in our life. How many of you, re what harvest are you reaping in your marriage, your parenting, your workplace, in your children? your church, and your society. Think about the negative words. Think about negative words like this. Aren't they like a weed? <laughs> They're easy to speak. They take root faster. They take little care to spread. And they produce a big harvest. And most of the times, they choke out the good words that are spoken to us or we speak to others. Negative words are important. This is why God wants us to change our speech. And just like Tony Evans, the pastor says, he wants to be the Lord, I like it, the Lord of our lips. Mm. You know, mm. Mm. I don't I'm kind of a little lock there. Mm. Be good. You know, David says, put a gate, gate, O Lord, over my mouth, you know, that I might not sin against you. See, we, so we don't want to produce a negative harvest of bullying by negative words. So most bullying and manipulation and relational breakdown, insecurities, depression, emotional, come from negative words we speak or negative words that are spoken, what we take in. More importantly, we may think we're getting away with our words, but Jesus says this amazing fact in Matthew 12. Of course, the context, they, they were attacking him and saying he was doing things out of the devil. Uh, but Jesus says, and I tell you this, you must give an account on judgment day for every idle word you speak. Do we believe that? Think about that. Think about that. Let that sink in. You will give an account 
for every idol you speak to your children, to your church, your pastor, your home group, your family, your neighbor, and on social media. God will hold us to account. When you're working with children naturally and spiritually, we extend grace for words that aren't spoken correctly. And we expect, but we do expect over time that those words begin to mature and the words that come from our mouths mature. And 1 Corinthians 13 puts it like this in the love chapter. says, when I was a child, how many of you were a child? <laughs> Hallelujah. We're not like off Mark and Mindy where you came out as an adult, but you, uh, you got to be old to know that one. But he says, when I was a child, I spoke and thought and reasoned as a child. But when I grew up, I put away childish things. Now, I don't like to be negative. Obviously, I'm sp speaking about our words. But I see a lot of childishness in God's people. People running here and there looking for the next big thing, speaking negatively about where they came from or, and, and talking foolishness. They're childish. We're supposed to have childlike faith. But as people, we're supposed to grow up and we're supposed to speak as adults and become mature. So the question is, is what crop do you want to experience in your life today? and in your relationships. The wonderful life in God is not about an attitude, our atti is about our attitude and it's reflected in our speech. So how do we change our harvest? You know, just because you've, you've used to negative words before and you've had those harvests doesn't mean that God can't redeem it. But what is it that we can do to start to produce the harvest that brings positive fruit in our mouths and in our hearts and in our lives? Is it a magic formula of words which you hear so often uh, with correct terminology and phrases like rubbing a genie bottle? Or is it more about the attitude of our heart reflected in how we speak our words? Jesus teach in Ma teaches in Matthew 12 uh, in the same context, a good person produces good things from the treasury of a good heart. And an evil person produces evil things from the treasury of an evil heart. Let that sink in from when you speak. Think about that verse. What's coming from our mouths? What's our words producing? You know, years ago, shortly after I came fa back to faith, I was convicted of this just in a simple conversation. It was found in Luke 19 when I was talking actually to my mom, and she didn't know what I was going through, but she, she starts quoting this verse, and God is funny because that's how the Holy Spirit works. And, but... Um, Jesus was ministering to an outsider named Zacchaeus in Luke 19. And Zacchaeus was a despised tax collector. He was condemned. Sorry, Florence, you're not despised. But he was. And he was condemned and he was ostracized in society, especially in the religious circles or the Jewish culture, because he was collecting taxes through the despised Romans. But Jesus engaged him with dialogue and he says, Zacchaeus is a short man hanging in a tree there. He says, come down, Zacchaeus. I want to eat dinner with you. And of course, everybody's like, oh, how could you eat with that guy? He's so horrible. But this simple act of kindness in the words that Jesus spoke transforms Zacchaeus so much so it says in Luke 19, Jesus says, um, Jesus responded, salvation has come to his home today for this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and save those things, those that were lost. That's the church's call. See, after Jesus continues this interaction of words with Zacchaeus, the positive, he begins to reflect on another part of words and attitude in the parable. It's about a master that sends out, or he goes away, but he's got 10 servants he calls, and he gives these 10 servants talents of silver before going on this long journey. In the parable, it reveals all of us with the 10 servants and the 10 talents of silver, reveals all of us have equal opportunity. There's no respect or person in God's kingdom. It also we have equal value just because I'm up here or someone's not up here or whatever, some success, some's not success. It doesn't matter. Every person that was created as an has equal value and opportunity. 
But upon returning, the king calls all the servants to account to what have they done with their 10 pieces of silver? Some have produced greater results. But that really wasn't the point. The point is actually revealed in the third servant that's called to account in Luke 19, 20. Listen to the words that happens. But the third servant brought back only the original amount of money and said, Master, I hid your money and kept it safe. I was afraid because you were a hard man to deal with taking what is not yours and harvesting crops you didn't plant. You wicked servant, the king roared. You remember this parable. Your own words condemn you. If you knew that I was a hard man who takes what isn't mine and harvests crops I didn't plant, why didn't you deposit any money or my money in the bank? At least I could have gotten some interest. Do you see what his words? It wasn't about the harvest. It was about the attitude and the words of this third servant. See, early in my faith, growing up around the church and after coming back, I viewed God like this third servant. I saw people and, and God often uh, through the lenses of judgment, thinking God was ready to punish me when I failed and discard me in my failures. My wrong view of God caused me to have great insecurity of my faith, to feel defeated in my failures and pride in my victories. And of course, it played out on how I viewed other people with my own standards of righteousness and morality, judging people similar to Job's friends. Then, like Zacchaeus, I would say through an innocent and unexpected conversation with my mom about this parable, again, she had no idea what, <laughs> what I was going through, I realized that my attitude and words were like the third servant. How many of us view God like that and others like that? Through the lenses of judgment and condemnation. This did not change my moral pursuit. But what it did do is it changed the motive of how I served God and saw others. Instead of seeing a duty of having to do all these things, I wanted to do them because I loved God. And because of, uh, I was convicted, I repented and committed uh, to reading God's words, written words through the lenses of forgiveness and mercy. And the result to me was personal freedom and confidence. Do you, are you confident in eternity and where you are today in your faith? Or are you worried about things or condemning to others? What motiv motivates your life? Is it duty or love? What lenses do you see God and people and, self, and yourself through? Is the God you serve the one that uh, goes to seek and save that which is lost and proclaim he so loved the world that he gave his only son? And a son who willingly laid down, wasn't murdered or killed, but laid down his life willingly so we could experience a wonderful life? Jesus says in Matthew 12, he says, the words you say will either acquit you or condemn you. Your wonderful life is connected to your words. Words are a big deal to God because words create. God created with his word. In John 1, it says, in the beginning was the word already, the word already existed. The word was with God, and the word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through him, and nothing was created except through him. It was God's word that was sent to restore creation back to life from our rebellion. Not someone else's, but our own rebellion. In John 14, uh, or 114, it says, it's got four and 14. It says, the word gave life to everything that was created and his life brought light to everyone. You know, prior to salvation and after salvation, we are given the life or the breath of life as God's creation, but we're not children of God until we get born again. And that word became flesh, the word that God spoke creation in, it became flesh and became human, Emmanuel, as Christmas celebrates, and made his home among us. See, our words matter because God's word created, creates, and we're made in the image of God so that our words create. In this world, you will have troubles, and they have a way of producing negative words, a bad report, an unkind word, a false teaching, 
an injustice, a social media post, social pressures, and wrong perceptions all produce negative words within our mouths and our hearts. Of course, this is Satan's main tactic for destroying your identity and from experiencing the abundant life Jesus promised. He supplants the good seed of God's word with false seeds through half-truths and negative circumstances. And of course, these seeds produce, they kill, they steal, and they provide death to our lives. And though it may be cliche to combat this attack and suffering, the negative words must be supplanted. Our negative talk, our negative words have to be supplanted with something better. Good words, positive words, words that produce the harvest for a wonderful life. And of course, there's three quick ways, not quick, but there's three ways uh, that that, can de- that takes place. First, you must know God's written word through study and relationship. Of course, it says that the word is given so that we know, may know Jesus. The second is we have to practice the sacrifice of praise in difficulty. And using our words and use our words to encourage. The written word is the first place we start. You know, when I was younger, the perception I had of myself was one of being unworthy, weak, a failure, and no good. Of course, that started in grade one when I was bullied. And it set me on a life of insecurity and trying to get accepted. This one negative circumstance caused me to be rebellious and insecure in other areas of my life. For others, insecurity shows up through high achievements or success. The only difference between someone that's uh, re- digressed and insecure and rebellious and someone that's a high achiever or pursuing success is how they deal with ins- insecurity, how you internalize your insecurity. The negative receptions and experiences that I went through held me in bondage even after faith until I read Psalms 139. Psalms, re- re- Psalms 139 revealed I was fearfully and wonderfully made by God despite my failures, and that his thoughts were precious towards me, that, of course, the psalm says, outnumbers the sands of the seashore. And that's how he views you guys. Everyone, everybody watching on YouTube, and everyone that's sitting here. One revelation of God's word changed my life when I realized that I was fearfully and wonderfully heard, or created. Not a piece of junk like I heard so much in religion. If you choose to believe God at his word, it'll change your life. It'll overcome the religious rhetoric and the crowd and the culture and the circumstances. Scripture, in scripture, there's a group of people in Acts that, that showed how to do that uh, correctly. Acts 17. It said, and the people of Berea were more open-minded than those in Thessalonica. And they listened eagerly to Paul's message They searched the scriptures day after day to see if Paul and Silas were teaching the truth. Are you willing to be a Berean type person? Having open-minded, searching the scriptures, not listening to a prophecy from somebody or a teaching from somebody or this and following them, but going to the scriptures and searching it day after day with open-minded to see what God says. Do you search the word to find Christ and to learn your identity. It's the first beginning of a wonderful life. The second is your sacrifice of praise. Scripture declares a spiritual war is being waged against humanity and requires spiritual weapons, not human philosophies or religious traditions, or any tradition. After the written word, it is the sacrifice of praise, which is the weapon of choice. Hebrews 13 says this, therefore, let us offer thorough, through Jesus a continual sacrifice of praise to God, proclaiming our allegiance to his name. And don't forget to do good and to share with those in need. These are the sacrifices that what? Please God. Not going to church to get what you want or hear. There's nothing wrong with that. But God's called his family to come together to offer the sacrifice of praise, and to help others so that we can please God. The reason it's called a sacrifice of praise is because it's always costly. It costs you to praise God. 
because a death has to occur in your life. You have to die to your own desires. You have to die to your own source of justice and your own emotional chemistry that's denying the goodness of God. And you have to praise God through your difficulty. To offer the sacrifice of praise is not about feelings, but a choice. Isaiah 61 says, God will do this. To all who mourn in Israel, he will give a crown of beauty for ashes, a joyous blessing instead of mourning, fest of praise instead of despair. In, the right, in their righteousness, of course, Christ is our righteousness, they will be great oaks that are plant, the Lord has planted for his own glory. In other words, you'll be immovable. It's the sacrifice of praise that blows off the chains of bondage and the, the tough times that we go for. The question is, are you willing to praise? Practice the sacrifice of praise despite the negative words that go through your mind and your heart or through suffering. Give it a try. Offer sacrifice of praise to God in the midst of suffering and gain the wonderful life of eternal internal freedom. The third and final point is encouraging words. It was in a victory church plant that I came back to God, through, and the plant was in High River, Alberta. This church recognized, as a leadership team, recognized the power of encouraging words. They made it a practice, and so they developed encouragement cards like this so that people could randomly anonymously write down encouraging words to others. After filling out the card, people would place the card in the offering plate, which we don't do, but we could do the Connect Center, and the ushers would then distribute it to the person it was written to. The simple, the simple act within our community brought health, joyful service, evangelism, and the church grew. What would it look like in God's family rather than attacking each other in our different positions of worship or attitudes if we practice the discipline of encouraging words? That as you're sitting there, God lays someone on your heart that you see in the congregation or maybe not, and you write down, God loves you. And I, he's got a plan and a purpose for you. And then they receive that. That's how prophecies that's how word and knowledge works. It draws people to Jesus. Could it be possible if we wrote down encouraging words and the words that we speak to one another would uh, cause unity to flourish by this simple act and lead others to a wonderful life in Christ? You know, we heard on our video, and we're going to just watch a short video illustration on what this woman uh, did when God put on her heart to speak encouraging words to someone uh, that she drove by or used it as a part of her life. So let's just watch that video. Is working in their lives. Hebrews 10 says this. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good words. What words are you hearing? What words are you hearing in your mind right now? And what words are you speaking to others? You know, the world will give us all, lots of opportunity to speak negative words. But God, as that pastor said, has redeemed our lips and our speech to be sacrifices of praises and thanksgiving. As we close, I just want to give you the opportunity. You can do it with texts or on an email, but we've done up these little cards called encouraging words. And it take just like her, you don't have to be all super spiritual and write all these, these scripture verses and stuff that's good to do at times, but you could just say God loves you. He knows what you're going through and he wants to bring healing to you. That's all you have to do. You can send it through a text, you can send it, and so like I said, we've got encouraging words. You can give it at the Connect Center, and it can be handed out. Just write the names person. You don't have to put your name on it. We didn't do that at the other place. It was anonymous. But it brought health to the believers. 
are the words that you're living right now in the time that we live in, in the churches that we attend? Are our words bringing hope or anxiety, purpose or acceptance, fear or courage? Are we living as victims or are we victorious? See, God did not create you to be defeated and in bondage. He created you to be free and creative, to use your ten talents of silver. But this will never happen unless you begin to confess positive words over your life and over the lives of others. It starts in Romans 10.9 if you don't know Jesus. If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Or maybe you've been sitting here and you see God like I did and others through the lenses of harsh judgment. Driven by duty, not out of love. Your relationship with God has become wearisome and you're tired. Trying to see God and others through the lenses. Try to see God now through the lenses of mercy, love, and forgiveness. It doesn't erase his holiness and justice. It brings hope to your heart and the people that you'll be speaking to. He's calling you right now, if you're seeing through the lenses of judgment, he's calling you to now speak life, not death, and displace your negative attitudes and words with his promises, despite the circumstances. Finally, over the last three years, we've seen great division within the church, within society, and with family. Vicious and hateful words spoken in person, and in multimedia. This is not God's way for the church. God's family is to be an instrument of hope, not division. The world needs God's family to change its course, especially in the West, to repent of the negative words that we've been speaking towards other family members, spiritually and physically, and other people, and even towards God. We need to repent and bring back the good news that Jesus came to seek and save that which is lost. The question is, are we willing to offer up the sacrifices of praises and offer encouraging words in the negative environment that we live in? In your marriage, are you speaking encouraging words? To your children, are you assuring them that they are loved despite their flaws? Are you the problem finder within a church family or in a, a workplace you offer all the strategies, but you're never, you're never willing to be the solution because it's too costly. It costs me time and reputation, and I just don't have it. God is calling you right now, all of us, to be a solution. He's calling us to build up our family and the family of God and to use our ten talents of silver, just as Ephesians 4 states. It says, He makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. See, God supplies the power, but we have to apply the elbow grease so that everyone has the opportunity to experience a wonderful life through the power of our words. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you that you sent your word to heal our diseases. It's not a physical disease that you started to heal, Lord, because that didn't really matter. We're all going to die at some point. You sent your word to heal our spiritual disease of sin. And so, Father, I just pray that we would get back onto that good news. And, Father, that doesn't mean that we erase the, the opportunity of physical healing because you're the same yesterday and today and tomorrow. But, Father, our hearts need to be first healed before our physical is healed. And so, Father, I speak life into this congregation. I thank you for this family. And, Father, forgive us as a church family and as individuals for speaking negatively about other church families, from going from here to there, looking for our own desires, rather than offering ourselves as a sacrifice to you, holy and pleasing, which is our reasonable act of worship. And in difficulty, offering you the sacrifice of praise, knowing that you are God. So Holy Spirit, come with your great power. You are in us, but clothe us that we may be your witnesses with our encouraging words. In Jesus' name, amen.